Hi everybody and welcome to the latest in our series of videos in the AQA Unit 2X, The Making of Modern Britain. This is the second of two videos examining social change for in the 1960s, specifically the period of 1964 through to 1970, that's when Harold Wilson led the first of his Labour governments. And this video focuses on three key areas of social change in particular. We're going to examine female equality, we're going to have a look at youth culture, and also at race relations. Let's start then with the issue of female equality. You'll remember if you watched our video on 1950s society, that although there had been some progress in women's day-to-day -day lives, for example, the invention of labour-saving devices, the impact of affluence were beginning to transform the day-to-day -day experience for a lot of women. Despite that, though, um, this traditional idea that a woman ought to be a wife and a mother and a housewife primarily, that traditional idea remained strong, particularly among working-class communities. As we move into the 60s, even towards the 70s, and um, those traditional gender stereotypes remain pretty powerful. And we can see that in particular when we look at secondary education. If you were a girl at a grammar school, but even more so at a secondary modern school, you wouldn't be hugely encouraged to do anything academic, often beyond the age of 15. And um, particularly in the secondary modern schools, the curriculum for young women focused on uh, well, domestic science that included cooking and needlework, for example. Clearly girls did do academic subjects, but the, the stress in those subjects was on preparing girls to be good mothers and wives and housewives. There was little expectation that women would necessarily go on to university, that they would pursue a career. And it's no surprise that even as we move into the 60s, quite a lot of girls leave school at the age of 15. Quite a lot of them are married by the age of 19, 20, 21. It wasn't the case that it was just men who went to university. Um, and what we do see in the 60s is a slight increase in the proportion of women who do go to university. Having said that, that statistic there speaks for itself. Um, even by 1970, only 28% university students are female, 72% are male. So there's still a limit in terms of um, academic opportunities for girls and for you. Moving on to look at the issue of work and also the issue of children. Um, it was certainly the case that what we tend to call the glass ceiling very much existed. Where women did go out to work, very few actually end up their career. We also see that very few women end up in some of the best paid professions of all. And that was the case even though, as we've said, slightly more women were going to university. Again, another quite telling statistic there. Um, only about 5% of women get to those managerial posts. And so there's a real sense of frustration among a lot of hugely capable, very intelligent women who ultimately feel that they are being it's certainly the case that there were lots of jobs available that women could do, but having said that, they tended to be concentrated in what we call the service or the clerical sector. Um, a lot of jobs in particular in nursing or in secretarial work, for example, some of those jobs not particularly well paid, um, and some of them there was little prospect in terms of developing a career or in terms of promotion. And it wasn't just about the practical reality of work, it was about attitudes as well. If you were to examine the media in the 60s, there was a real sense that if you were a woman who went out to work, you were selfish, you were somehow abandoning your children. On a practical level again, um, it was very, very difficult for both parents to go out for work and to get childcare because ultimately nurseries or private nurseries were very expensive, only the rich afford them, uh, far fewer childminders than there are today. So both in terms of attitudes, but the practical reality and, and the possibilities, very difficult for women to go out to work and to forge a career. Having said that, as we move towards the end of the decade, as we move towards 1970, there is some progress for 
in a couple of laws passed by Parliament, which suggests that the tide is beginning to turn. Um, 1970, this Matrimonial Property Act. Now, this is a really quite significant one. So this was based on the idea that quite often when men and women got divorced, because it had generally been the man who'd gone out to work, who had earned money, women were often ending up literally living in poverty in divorce in a very difficult financial position. What the Matrimonial Property Act tries to do is to make the situation for women after the divorce as close as possible on a financial level as it had been. And so the Matrimonial Property Act recognises in law that divorce was having a disproportionately difficult impact on women. It is a sign that at least in Parliament there are some changes. Another positive development, although as we'll see it's limited, was the Equal Pay Act. This was something that the feminist movement had been fighting for for decades. The idea that if you're a woman and you do the same job as a man, you should be paid equally, the kind of thing that we take for granted these days, we would hope. But ultimately, this was a real battle that had to be fought by the feminist movement. In 1970, the Equal Pay Act is passed. The limitation here is that it doesn't actually come into force until 1975. So this is progress, but it's progress whole. Moving on to talk more generally about the feminist movement, something that had developed through the 50s and particularly into the 60s is what we call second wave feminism. This is based on the idea that in the early 20th century there'd been what we call the first wave of feminism, which was focused in particular on suffrage, on uh, women gaining the vote, um, which of course happened in Britain in 1918 and then equally in 19. Now, second wave feminism said, well, that's all great. And that was clearly really important progress. But ultimately, we have a whole generation of women now who are still very restricted. Gender stereotypes are strong. Plenty of women who would want to go out to work, who are being denied that opportunity. And second wave feminists, particularly Betty Friedan, a very important American feminist, said women are unfulfilled. Their lives are restricted. And they are not fulfilled by them. Women ought to be given more opportunities. So we've got Betty Friedan writing in America. Her ideas spread towards Britain as the 60s went on. And as well as Betty Friedan, we've got feminists like Jermaine Greer. Her book, The Female Eunuch, was a very important one um, in the feminist movement. Juliette Mitchell as well. And what we see during the 60s is the rise of women's liberation groups, often shortened to women's lib. And these were local groups, although there was a national one as well, um, which worked together to try and gain both economic equality for women and also social equality as well. And what we find in the 60s and the 70s is that feminists fight both for equality in the workplace, but also increasingly for social equality. There's a real focus, for example, on reproductive rights. And in a future video about feminism in the 70s, We'll explore those different types of feminism in more depth. More evidence of the growing feminist movement. 1969, we've got the Women's National Coordination Committee being set up, which tries to combine different groups of feminists together. And then the Women's Lib Movement, very strong by 1970. In Oxford, we've got the first British National Women's Liberation Conference being held. And at that conference, the British feminist movement very much set out their stance. They're asking for equal pay, um, equality in education and employment, uh, free 24-hour childcare, back to that issue we talked about a moment ago, and also, and again coming back to reproductive rights, free abortion on request and free contraception as well. Um, there had been a little bit of progress in 1967 where under the terms of the NHS Act, local councils had to provide contraception and advice on contraception first time. But of course, the women's lib movement said, well, this is great, but that ought to be just the beginning. The interesting thing is that despite the rise of the feminist movement in the 60s, it's really not till the 1970s that we see very significant progress. So even by 1969, 1970, those traditional attitudes towards the place of women remain pretty pervasive in British society. There's nothing like equality. 
of equal pay yet. There's nothing like equality in terms of educational opportunities and in terms of reproductive rights as well. There's still plenty of progress that needs to be made. Having said that, by the end of the 60s, the feminist movement is well on the way in terms of ensuring that that change will Let's move on to have a little look at youth culture. Um, we touched on this when we looked at the 50s, but it's even more the case in the 60s that as living standards continue to improve, um, as leisure opportunities and leisure time continue to grow, increasingly we get young people setting themselves apart from the older generation and developing their own examples and types of youth culture. So when we looked at the 50s, we took, for example, about the teddy boys, we looked at the early 60s and talked about mods and rockers. When we look at the later 1960s, we tend to talk about skinheads and the hippies. So we've got the skinheads, this group grow out of the mods. We've got the hippies, who often we associate with the anti war movement, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, the hippies, of course, are very much associated with what was often called flower power. They talk about free love, they're very concerned about environmental issues, and of course, that focus on well. So the skinheads and the hippies, two groups which are hugely different to each other, two groups which are very distinctive expressions of a new youth culture. And in the 60s, and this is one of those cases where the stereotype about the 60s is, is pretty true. You know, this was the time that being a teenager was an exciting thing. Um, young people are questioning those traditional social attitudes. They are increasingly say, saying to the older generation, look, we do have different attitudes and that's fine. It's good and we will be ourselves. And that's true when it comes to drugs, when it comes to sex, to fashion, to music and attitudes towards those wider moral issues as well. Having said all of that, the stereotype of the swinging 60s can take a little bit too far. So is it the case that all young people are using LSD and other illegal drugs? Well, it isn't. And actually, legal drugs like tobacco and alcohol are still far more widely used by young people than illegal drugs. It was also the case, and that 1969 survey revealed it, that if you're a teenager, you're not constantly out at festivals or dancing at youth clubs. You may just be sat in your bedroom listening to music on the radio. So the idea that all young people all the time are out there at festivals taking illegal drugs is just a true to breaking point. Having said that, young people are increasingly confident and groups like the hippies and the skinheads are examples of that changing youth culture. Let's think a little bit more about youth culture then, particularly about fashion and music. London increasingly is a really central place in terms of the changing the 1960s and what you've got to remember about Britain in the earlier 20th century is Britain is a pretty traditional place right down to the sorts of rules about what you should wear, when you should wear it, where you should wear it. All of a sudden in the 60s in London some of those rules are bonafide. So for example women wearing trousers at shop horror and um, it was a big thing and uh, men wearing bright colours and would you believe for the first time it's possible to turn up to work in a particular outfit and then to go out in those same clothes in the evening all of these just chipping away at those almost unspoken social rules one of the really interesting things we've talked about women wearing trousers for example is that some of those traditional gender distinctions are just being blurred but changing fashion also blurs some of those traditional class distinctions as well. Before the 60s, if you walked down the street and bumped into someone, you could pretty easily tell which social class they were from by what they were wearing. Um, go back a few decades, if somebody was wearing a top hat, they were upper class. If somebody was wearing a bowler hat, they were probably middle class. If they were wearing a flat cap, they were probably working class. If they weren't wearing a hat, you'd probably be quite surprised. Um, and, and so class and clothing were very closely related. As things begin to change in the 60s, those distinctions are blurred. 
We talked a minute ago about young people in their bedrooms listening to the radio. Um, we've talked in an early video about pirate radio, and that, that was something that was very popular with young people. Once the BBC get in on the act and Radio 1 becomes a really important vehicle for broadcasting pop music after 1967, that is the station of voice for a lot of young people. Well, and some of these really big programmes that last for decades, Top of the Pops in particular, and um, that is where new music is being played. Young people really into programmes like Top of the Pops, um, not just the music, but also new dance crazes, and again, uh, new fashion trends as well. Young people are seeing those on TV for the first time, and then recreating them. Once again, we've got a real link between the growth of technology and music and youth culture as well. In particular, um, cheap plastic records and record players make it very easy for young people to buy and listen to and access new music at a very limited price. Another area where youth culture um, overlaps with some of the politics and the foreign policy that we look at in this module um, is when it comes to the Vietnam war. Now the Vietnam War was of course one of the really prominent issues globally towards the mid and late 1960s. Um, just a quick reminder, the Vietnam War began in 1964 when President Johnson um, decided to send US troops to Vietnam after the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Towards the end of the 1960s the Vietnam War was no closer finishing. There were huge protests against it. Back in America, there was a real sense that the US was getting bogged down in a war that it couldn't win. Uh, tens of thousands of young US lives were being needlessly lost. That was the feeling. But in America and in Britain and across the world as well, there was another aspect of the anti-Vietnam War protests. And that was the fact that the US was doing things in that war which were seen morally wrong. The US claiming to, to represent freedom and democracy against the evils of communism, and yet it was the US that was dropping an APAR on children, that was destroying jungle, um, were massacres like the My Lai massacre, for example. All sorts of actions which were seen as morally completely unacceptable, and the anti-Vietnam War movement was growing. And younger people, particularly some of the hippie movement, were very active in that. And um, quite interesting, um, it wasn't just young people, we also get these teachings being held at universities like Oxford and the LSE, uh, teachings where you know, guest lecturers would come in and they would lecture for 24 hours um, about some of the horrors of what was happening in Vietnam or some of the arguments against war. Um, equally, uh, a lot of university students get very involved in this Vietnam solidarity campaign. In particular, a lot of anti-Vietnam War protests and a lot of young people get involved in that um, is centred on the US Embassy in Grosvenor Square in London. There are two demos in March 1968 um, which erupt into violence, particularly the second one, um, known in popular culture as the Battle on Grosvenor Square, you end up with about 200. Now, later in the year, you get another huge demonstration. There's over 30,000 people there, also in Grosvenor Square. It's mainly peaceful, but, and, and this is very much perpetuated by the media as well, there is a sense that the anti-Vietnam War protests have descended too quickly into violence. Having said that, the hippie movement is still very much keen to argue for peace with non-violent methods as well. 1968, as you may know, is a really significant year, not just in Britain, but across Europe and America. Um, real incidents of student unrest, student sit-ins, uh, student riots, not just in London, but in Paris, uh, in parts of the US as well. So 1968 is the absolute high point of that, and that's certainly the case in Britain. So when we're talking about youth culture, and particularly the hippie movement, the involvement in anti-Vietnam protests is a really very significant part of it as well. Um, a couple of useful specific examples there of the way in which young people are 
uh, get involved um, controversially um, at the University of Essex you have uh, two Conservative MPs being attacked um, in Cambridge you've got Dennis Healy who's Wilson's Defence Secretary um, and students at Cambridge University um, almost managed to, to destroy and overturn Dennis Healy's car so these might sound like relatively isolated incidents but as part of that bigger picture of student unrest in 1968, they add to what they pick. Overall, then, as well as the fact that we've got mods and the hippies and we've got new music, anti Vietnam is an important in the late 1960s. Moving on finally to race relations, and you'll remember that in the 1950s, one of the really significant aspects of race relations was immigration from what we call the New Commonwealth, particularly from India from Pakistan, from parts of the Caribbean. And that immigration continues during the 1960s. And as well as all the benefits that that brings to the economy and to society, it also means that those tensions that existed in the 50s do exist in the 60s as well. The survey that I refer to there is really quite shocking and it shows just how entrenched some people's attitudes were and it shows the level at the depth of social tension too. Let's have a look at those figures. So 20% of white people object to working with people from an ethnic minority. Half of white people would refuse to live next door to a black person. 90%, a huge number against mixed marriages. And um, quite astonishing figures looking at it from our 21st century perspective. So don't underestimate the depths of racial tension in the 1960s. Now, again, we do have some progress. Parliament passes the Race Relations Act in 1965, and this is the beginnings of trying to use the law to ban racial discrimination. And it extends to public places, but crucially, it's limited. It doesn't cover housing. It doesn't cover employment as well. Clearly, two hugely significant areas that aren't being protected under the law. The Act, on the other hand, does set up something called the Race Relations Board, and if people do have complaints under the provision of the Act that they've been discriminated against, they can take it to the Race Relations Board. There's a sense that the 65 Act doesn't go far enough, and that's why it's followed up by the 68 Race Relations Act, and that does then ban discrimination in employment and housing, and also in insurance as well. Nevertheless, and again, there is a but here, there's some limitations. So what employers could argue is that they had to preserve racial balance. So in other words, they couldn't go too far in the other direction. They still had to potentially employ plenty of white people. They could argue that on the grounds of balance. So it's a little loophole there that employers could use potentially on discriminating. Also the case that the one group you couldn't complain against was the police. Again, that really did. Uh, that caused problems. The police themselves who were being discriminatory, there seemed to be very little comeback. And what we find ultimately is that a lot of victims of race based crime and of discrimination increasingly think, well, we're not going to bother complaining to the Race Relations Board because ultimately we don't reckon they're going to do anything. We don't think they really can do anything. So actually, the board doesn't receive any complaints. It's also the case that even where the board does receive complaints, by employment it only upholds 10%. So we can see here quite a familiar pattern. There is some progress in terms of the legal position, but there are some quite significant limitations in terms of the practical applications of those race relations. Having said all of that, there were some definite positives and some real signs that in places of community cohesion. Um, in particular, in London, we had the Notting Hill Carnival, and um, that became a really um, famous and really positive and significant annual event from 1964 onwards. It's also the case that a lot of British people very much appreciated the fact that all of a sudden, in their town, there were some Chinese takeaways, there were some corner shops that were run by recent immigrants, um, and it genuinely is the case that, that people did enjoy being introduced to a much wider, much uh, more varied uh, diet and, and range of food as well. Going back to youth culture again, 
um, a lot of younger people very much embrace the positive aspects of immigration. So you've got examples, for instance, of the hippies wearing Indian scarves and cotton from Africa. And also the case that some of the new music that uh, young people were listening to very much influenced by uh, immigrants from the Caribbean, particularly ska and reggae. One other interesting thing, and this is very much about the Beatles, particularly George Harrison, um, the Beatles spent quite a bit of time as the 60s go on um, in the Far East with the Maharaja Mahachiyogi. Uh, they become very interested in some of this Eastern spirituality. And a lot of younger generation, particularly people who are into the Beatles, are quite influenced by this too. So certainly when it comes to parts of the country, particularly parts of London, when it comes to a lot of younger people as well, there is a real sense that immigration has been a positive thing and that we ought to be embracing all the good things about it, whether it's food, whether it's music, whether it's spiritual. Having said all of that, there is a really controversial aspect of this during the 1960s and that focuses very much on one man in particular, and that person is Enoch Powell. Now, Enoch Powell was a member of Ted Heath's Shadow Cabinet, and he'd been a prominent conservative politician for a long time. <coughs> Excuse me, and he remains one of the most divisive and controversial figures of British politics in the 20th century. Just to explain what happened, um, what we get in 1968 is um, a real surge in immigration from Kenya. Um, the Kenyan Asians increasingly um, come to Britain. We've talked before about the Ugandan Asians, uh, the Kenyan Asians, people of Indian origin, but who've been living in Kenya. Um, there is a surge in that group into Britain in 1968. Now that is actually limited uh, by the Commonwealth Immigration Act of 1968, but not before significant numbers of people have come. And Enoch Powell looks at the rise in immigration by the Kenyan Asians and he says this is unacceptable. And he makes a speech which has become known as the Rivers of Blood speech. Powell refers back to the River Tiber in Rome. He uses some analogies from ancient Rome about the River Tiber foaming with much blood. It's a hugely powerful and pretty shock from it there. So Powell says, look, the UK must be mad, literally mad to allow so much immigration. And perhaps most controversially of all, he said, white British people now feel like strangers in their own country. Now, in some quarters, not surprisingly, there's absolute horror at what Powell says. Um, many of his own Conservative Party disown him. The Labour Party attacks him. Heath himself sat from the shadow cabinet. Heath is very entirely unacceptable. Interestingly though, Powell does get a lot of support from the general public. That poll there, uh, quite representative of, it, of the public at the time, about three quarters of British people think Powell has got a point. Um, interestingly, strikes by groups of people he would imagine generally would be Labour voters at the time, uh, dockers, meat porters, go on strike, go on marches, They're saying we back Enoch, we support Powell. There's even a protest march to Downing Street itself saying Powell should not have been sacked. So it's a hugely divisive speech. It's very interesting in exposing some of the different attitudes between what we might call the establishment on the one hand and a lot of ordinary working people. And it's a sign as well of the growing social tension that immigration has caused. So we've got a real mixture there. Of positive aspects of immigration, groups of younger people in particular are absolutely embracing new culture, but equally a real hostility, not just from Powell himself, but from some ordinary working people as well. So Britain by the end of the 1960s is a Britain which has changed significantly when it comes to race, when it comes to youth culture, and when it comes role of women. But as we'll see, it's not till the 1970s that we get closer towards the multicultural Britain where there's a move towards equality for women that we're more used to 
huge thank you to Tom for another really interesting video. Lots of great stuff there on um, the challenges and, and some of the positives uh, of cultural change and, and societal change in the 1960s. Uh, this is part of our series looking at the making of modern Britain 1951 through to 2007. And Tom will continue uh, to produce more of these wonderful videos for us and I'll keep adding them to the channel. And hope we should ultimately have full coverage of that unit. Just to remind you that there are other playlists covering other history topics, including um, Tsarist and Communist Russia and Tudor Britain, as well as uh, American stuff, including uh, stuff on the American Civil War. So lots of history stuff on here, lots of politics stuff on there if you're interested in politics or studying politics as well. So do subscribe uh, and, and show your appreciation to Tom by hitting like uh, for this video and leaving some comments as well. Thank you very much for watching.